Hello, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give the students here and all of the, your Biola students and indeed all the saints everywhere a spirit of wisdom and revelation in their knowledge of you, that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened, that they would know the hope that they've been called to, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and the surpassingly great power that's at work within us who believe. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As you know, I'm, or as least most of you probably know, I'm talking on the problem of evil today, and as you also know, that's a gigantic subject. Most people consider this to be the question of the ages. Personally, by the way, I know, I do believe and argue in my class, I teach a two-unit class in the master's program on why God allows evil, and I think we know why God allows evil. We may not know the specific reasons for specific evils, although as a Christian, you and I, as we go through those hard things, those sufferings, we look back on it and we can see what God has worked in our lives even then. I wish I had 24 hours to talk on this because I really like to talk on why God allows evil and I'm going to focus this even more. When I talk about eternal life in the kingdom of God, I spend nine hours on it because I think it's one of the most undertaught on subjects in all of Christianity. And I'm going to just focus on one of these aspects and that is, of course, as I said, focusing on forever. This is an important part of the problem of evil. As C.S. Lewis put it, Scripture and tradition habitually put the joys of heaven into the scale against the sufferings of earth, and no solution to the problem of pain that does not do so can be called a Christian one. In other words, eternal life is part of the answer to why God allows evil. And as somebody has put it, eternity dwarfs our suffering here to insignificance. But the question is, can eternity make up for all of our suffering here? In other words, as I said, will heaven be worth it? Is it going to be worth it? Will it make up for all the suffering that we're enduring here? And I've learned over the years that there's an awful lot of Christians that are desperately afraid that heaven won't be worth it. As I, one, I encountered an undergrad one day after I was teaching and she had to fight back tears that because she was afraid that she didn't want to go to heaven because she thought all we're going to do is sit there and sing forever and ever and ever and ever. And that just didn't appeal to her. And anyway, you get the point. I've learned over the years that what Satan's doing, and I encourage you to watch this in television and movies and whatnot, what Satan's doing is he's working overtime to depict heaven as a place that you don't want to be. Very simply, he's working very hard at this. This is what I call, Satan's work in this regard, his propaganda about heaven is what I call extreme makeover metaphysical edition. <laughs> Let me just give you a couple of them real fast. One is, heaven's going to be white. Listen, if you read the book of Revelation of anything, heaven is composed of rubies and emeralds and topaz and sapphires and amethysts and so on. It's not white. After I taught on this in another place, uh, a guy told me the next day, he was driving along with his six-year-old son, he said, hey, Billy, what, what color is heaven? And Billy says, it's white. Also, and we get this idea that in heaven we're going to all be sporting flightless wings. That's false. We're going to have bodies like Jesus' body. We think, we're told that in heaven's going to be full of dreary prudes. That's also false. Believe me, I've got news for you. Heaven is going to be full of adulterers and murderers and liars and cheats, but they're all going to be repentant. The unrepentant liars and cheats and whiners are going to be in hell. But now I'm going to focus specifically on just one aspect of heaven because obviously it's a big subject. Our occupation, what are we, what are the true saints of God going to be doing in heaven? What are we going to be doing in heaven forever? And in short, I'm going to tell you something that's rather dramatic and amazing. God's plan for you and for the kingdom of God is that you're going to reign over the kingdom of God with Jesus. That's the plan. I call your attention, first of all, to a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, and it says this. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Now listen to this next sentence. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And the first time I read that, I was like, wow, reigning must be, mean something really bizarre because I don't all of a sudden know what reigning means if I'm going to reign with Jesus. Then Paul says about this, keep reminding them of these things. Keep reminding them, if we 
endure with him, what? If we put up with suffering and overcome evil with good in this world, if we endure with him, we will reign with him. And he says, keep reminding them. In other words, this was like an early church memory verse, uh, a maxim, a creedal statement. Keep telling them this, these things. This is a trustworthy statement. You can bank on it. If we endure, we will reign. So as we endure hardship and suffering and endure evil as, have, as Jesus would have you endure it, you will reign. But let me now go into the context of this because like I say, it seems almost too amazing. Let me get into the context of this. God originally created humankind to reign. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the first thing we know about humankind, it says this. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So let's just stop there for a second. Here's the creator of the universe who spoke all things into existence, who rules, saying, let's make man like us. So he says, let's go back. Let, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And what are the next words? And let them rule. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over all the livestock, livestock and over all the earth and all the creatures that move along the ground, let them rule. But as you know, this rulership doesn't last very long because Satan conquered our first parents. He defeated them in the Garden of Eden. God had ordered, told Adam and Eve to rule over the animal kingdom, but unfortunately, they let a serpent deceive them. And let us be clear, Satan won a great victory that day, and he ruled over the universe instead. In fact, if you'll remember at the temptation of Jesus, Satan tells Jesus to worship him. He says, all of the kingdoms of the earth and the authority and splendor has been given to me. And Jesus doesn't call him a liar, by the way, because they had. And I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it'll all be yours. In Acts 26, 18, Jesus said, the whole world is under the power of Satan. In John 12, 31, Jesus calls Satan the ruler of the world. So what's happened? You know what happened next. The next thing that happened is Christ came and he conquered Satan to rescue us from Satan's reign. He conquered to rescue us from Satan's reign. And so in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, the scripture says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, you see that? By his death, he destroyed him who holds the power of death. In Colossians 2.15, the scripture says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. How did he triumph over the powers and authorities in Satan? By the cross. How did Jesus defeat Satan? By being obedient to death. And I call your attention to an interesting passage in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2. And it begins, And I saw the mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David, has conquered. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. An interesting thing. So the lion of the tribe of Judah, of course, you know we're talking about Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered. And what does John see in the next sentence? John says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne encircled by four living creatures and elders. There's an ironic victory here. And the ironic victory is the lion of the tribe of Judah is conquered. And, G and, and John looks and he says, and I saw a lamb looking like it had been slaughtered. I saw a slaughtered lamb. Jesus the conqueror, a slaughtered lamb. Jesus willingly suffered humiliation, physical torture, and death in order to conquer so that you and I would be free from Satan's reign. And so now we are up to date on the history of reigning. We've seen what's happened. And so now, you and I, 
are learning to conquer the world and Satan right now. We're learning, actually, right now to reign. We're learning to conquer right now on this earth. But the way we conquer is not through political strategy. It's not through boardroom manipulation. It doesn't require a lot of money. We conquer like he conquered. But wait a minute, how did he conquer? He conquered by simply honoring God and doing God's will no matter what it was. That's how Jesus conquered. The slaughtered lamb conquered. Now notice in eight, Romans 8.35, an interesting passage. Sounds a lot like Revelations. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, we face death all day long and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. The world looks at you and I and they say, they just look like sheep that are ready to be slaughtered to us. But then it says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And it's very similar to Revelation. The slaughtered lamb conquered. And then it says here, we're like sheep to be slaughtered. That's how they see us. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We can conquer too. So how do we conquer? How do you and I conquer in this world right now? We conquer like Jesus conquered. When we face satanic forces and sickness and evil and hardship, and we're like sheep to be slaughtered, we just continue to honor God and do his good and glorify him, do his will and glorify him, and we will conquer in the heavenly realms. You remember Job. Life's going good for Job. He has lots of kids. He's got lots of sheep and goats. He's got all kinds of cattle. He's the richest man in all the world. And Satan one day tells God that the only reason that Job serves God is that God has made Job's life easy. And what's Satan saying? Job only honors you, or maybe even we could make that bigger. People only honor you because you make their lives easy. If you don't make their lives easy, they won't honor you. And I suspect that there's an unspoken premise there, and I think the unspoken premise is, I wouldn't have rebelled if you'd made my, given me everything I wanted to. You understand what I'm saying? Hey, if you'd given me all I wanted, I just wouldn't have rebelled. And so Satan justifies himself if he can say, see, they couldn't handle it either. They won't serve you if you don't give them everything they ever want. They won't serve you. They won't honor you. So God allows Satan, as you know, to afflict Job and Job's children are killed. His possessions are taken. He's afflicted with boils and his wife says, curse God and die. And what did, I want you to think about this, what did Job have to do to conquer and humiliate Satan and to prove that God was right all along? What did he have to do? What was the only thing Job had to do to humiliate Satan in the heavenly realms? All Job had to do when this hardship came upon him was to continue to honor God. All he had to do is stay faithful and say, I still honor God. And as long as he kept saying, I still honor God, he humiliated Satan in the heavenly realms. And that's how you and I humiliate Satan in the heavenly realms is when hardship comes upon us and we continue to honor God, we humiliate him because he couldn't take it. Even if we're physically killed in this battle, we conquer when we remain faithful. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So as we remain faithful to God, as we endure satanic attacks and persecutions and worldly troubles and sickness, we conquer. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our battle isn't against other humans. Our battle is against spiritual forces in the heavenly places that have rebelled against God. And I'll tell you something, spiritual battles rage as much around dining room tables and in dorm rooms and surfing the internet and choosing a movie at Blockbuster as they ever will on any battlefield. 
The most important battles that you and I are going to face are spiritual. That's why Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And he says, yes, I tell you, fear him. Don't worry about those who can kill the body. And I've got a thought for you. Comparatively, your physical death isn't that important. Do you understand that's what Jesus is saying? Your physical death isn't that important. Quadriplegics, by the way, battle Satan as harder, if not harder, than any member of the special forces ever will. Why? Because the principal point in the conflict is in here. We're learning to overcome evil with good, and we're learning to stand up and do the right things here and now. We're learning to reign and to conquer now. And what you need to do is you need to learn to reign in your brain. It's not easy, is it? Why? Because God is preparing you now, and it doesn't matter whether you're an athlete or whether you're in a wheelchair. God is preparing you to reign over the kingdom with him forever. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, if you lose a job or if you find a lump under your arm one day in the shower, or if someone very close to you dies, or you one day are informed that you have a terminal disease, and all of your friends and family are watching you because they know your life's just gotten extremely difficult and they're all watching you. And if you say, you know what, I still trust God, then you humiliate Satan in the heavenly places and you are honor God in front of everybody, angels and humans. And you learn to reign and conquer Satan in this realm. And finally, we're going to learn to reign forever and ever. We're going to learn, we're learning here to reign over the kingdom of God because that's exactly what the plan is. Let me call your attention now and spend the last few minutes on forever. Daniel 7 verse 18, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, ever and ever. It doesn't say they'll get to enjoy it. They're going to possess it. Then in verse 27 it says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And listen to this. And his rulers will worship and obey him. That There it is again. The true servants of Christ, he's preparing to reign. He's preparing to rule. And when the kingdom comes, he's going to make them rulers. That's you and me. Jesus said in Luke 12, 32, one of my favorite verses. I love the simplicity of it. Jesus says, fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let me say that again. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Then in verse 42 of the same chapter, Jesus says, The one who is faithful and wise will be put in charge of all his possessions. Going to put him in charge of all his possessions. In Luke 19, 17, Jesus is telling a parable that it, in, for the faithful steward it ends this way. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Did you hear that? Ten cities. So Dallas Willard asked this question. Perhaps it would be a good exercise for each of us to ask ourselves, really, how many cities could I govern under God? For example, if Baltimore or Liverpool were turned over to me with the power to do with it what I want to, how would things turn out? An honest answer to this question might do much to prepare us for our eternal future in the universe. You understand? You're learning to be responsible over things here so that in the kingdom of heaven, he can give you tremendous responsibility. Revelation 2.26, it says, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. And then in verse 29, Jesus says, He who is an ear, let him hear 
what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you understand that? That's a divine listen up. Do you hear what I'm saying? He who overcomes and does my will, I will give him authority over the nations. But you'll notice too that Jesus is connecting reigning with overcoming hardship. Those who overcome reign. But thankfully the scripture says that everyone born of God overcomes the world. And you may be sitting there today and saying, well I feel like I'm struggling with so much sin. Stay in Jesus. He will overcome it in your life and you will become somebody who conquers sin. Stay in Jesus. We're not going to be just sitting on a cloud forever and ever. We're not. God's plan for us isn't to become cloud potatoes. Rather, God's plan for us is that we will reign with vast authority. Do you realize, by the way, that you're going to judge the world and that you're going to judge angels? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, it says this, Do you not know, just like I put it basically, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? The question, of course, arises immediately, I think, is why in the world would we be qualified to judge the world or to judge angels? And the answer is actually pretty simple. Because throughout Scripture, those who have the less evidence of God's existence but trust him are qualified to judge those who had more evidence but did not trust him. So as you trust God by faith, when you hang out and you say, you know what, I know he lives. And thankfully we have the resurrection of Christ to base our faith on that this is an actual historical event. But when we go on and we say, I continue to just simply trust God, we have less evidence than the angels did, don't we? I mean, well, yes, we have less evidence than the angels did, right? Because the angels actually saw God. I think, by the way, that the problem of evil is the major question in the heavenly realms. Is God good? They never, however, conclude that God doesn't exist. And that's what God's doing in this world, is he's answering this question. And we are proving the will of God, and proving that he is good by our very lives. But as I said, those who have the less evidence of God's existence are in a rightly positioned to judge those who had more but didn't obey him. Matthew 12, 41, Jesus said, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Do you understand that? At the judgment day, Jesus just said that the men who repented when Jonah preached at Nineveh are going to judge the generation that Jesus was preaching to. Do you understand? That's what he just said. The queen of the south just happens to hear, hey, there's a wise man out there hundreds of miles away, thousands even, I'm going to go see him. Why? Because he just heard that Solomon was a wise man. And Jesus says that woman's going to stand up at the judgment and condemn the generation that I'm preaching to because they had less evidence than the generation I'm preaching to has. Thus, you and I who live by faith and not by sight are rightfully positioned to judge angels because they actually saw God and yet rebelled. And so when you continue to honor God in suffering and hardship and overcome evil with good, you justify, as I said, the devil's com- uh, condemnation. So in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, the very first thing we ever learn about humankind, chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26, as I mentioned already, God said, let's make man in our own image and in our own likeness and let them rule. Now we go to the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation 22. In fact, if we go to the last verse of the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, just before the epilogue, 
You know, the epilogue is, don't add to these words, don't take away from them. That's the epilogue. You know, I'm coming soon. The last verse before you get to the epilogue reads this way. And they will reign forever and ever. Did you hear that? And they will reign forever and ever. So the first thing in the Bible we know about humankind is that God created them to rule. And the last thing we know about humankind in Revelation 22 verse 5 is and they will reign forever. That's God's plan for you. <clears throat> but does this sound like a fairy tale to you? Does this sound like Snow White or Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty? These women who were put under spells or entrapped by evil to be freed by a, a prince and what, then they live happily ever after, right? They marry the prince and they live happily ever after. Does our being under bondage to Satan and in misery and sickness and suffering here to be freed by Jesus who takes us into his kingdom to reign forever and ever, does this sound like a fairy tale? Well, if it does, you have it exactly backwards. Fairy tales sound like this. Do we get it? He's giving us the kingdom. Not just any kingdom, but the kingdom. And when he comes, there won't be any other. We get it all. This isn't the Disneyland all day pass or all year pass. This is a controlling interest in part of heaven. He's giving us the deed to the property. But you say, perhaps this isn't true. Listen, if this isn't true, you should go out and buy the biggest screen, biggest big screen TV you can find and drink your brains out. But if it is true, he's given us all things. Make up your mind between who it is, which it is. He's giving us a controlling interest in part of heaven. He talks about cities. He talks about true riches. He tells us to be faithful over things here. The things that seem so big to us. But then he tells us that the things that seem so big to us are small. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if we think these small things big, what are we going to do when we see really big things? Well, really big things come, and you're going to reign over them, and you're going to do it with Jesus. This is God's plan for your life, and it's always been the plan. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would reveal the truth to these students and any doubts that they have, the things that they've heard that they don't understand, I pray that you would resolve those. And Father, that you would just simply reveal to them the glory that awaits them in heaven. And as Peter said in 1 Peter, help them to set their hope fully, fully upon the grace to be given them when Jesus Christ is revealed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.